Thank you, brave people, because it's the last panel of the day. Um, and we're going to have a wonderful discussion because the thing that we taught, we've been, we're, we're focusing on in this panel, which is what does it mean to respect our elders, has come through every single panel and keynote presentation today. Um, whether we've been talking about culture, whether we've been talking about um, law, um, funding priorities, this has been a through line all, um, all day, and I'm sure it will continue tomorrow. So I'm very happy, I'll, I'll cut to the chase very quickly, but we have at least three disciplines and two aging society on stage, three if, if you consider the United States as well. Um, Professor Lee uh, from Nursing and Gerontological Research here at uh, CUHK, uh, Dr. Enwai Chong um, from Geriatric and Community Medicine in Singapore, and Professor Fan from Philosophy and um, Public Policy also here in Hong Kong. So, a couple of things uh, just to get our, 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 our panelists uh, started. Recalling uh, that slide that Professor Kwok had this morning of the woman who'd been restrained for three years so she could be tube fed, we might ask as a, a couple of questions for this session, when does culture or law or clinical uncertainty get in the way of treating persons with respect or treating elders with respect? And recalling um, Dr. Dunn's presentation this morning where he came up with a theory of, of how we should uh, approach a chronic and terminal illness, we might ask, how should this elder be respected? What should we have done or what, what should we do in like cases? So uh, with those uh, guiding questions in mind, I will turn it over to Professor Lee. Thank you, Nancy, and good afternoon again. Um, this panel discussion is about um, what does it mean to respect our older person, and I would like to address this panel by sharing with you my work on how Chinese older people perceive what is privacy and dignity in residential care homes in Hong Kong. I think privacy and dignity, these are important basic principles of humanity, and Respecting privacy and dignity are important goals of care, especially for gerontological practice. But these two concepts of privacy and dignity, they are very socioculturally determined because they are construed through sociocultural norms and traditions. And so privacy and dignity is very sensitive to sociocultural differences. So what a Western person see as privacy and dignity will be quite different from a Chinese person in terms of how they see what is privacy and dignity. But when one looks into the literature, again, we found that a lot of the knowledge about what does it mean to respect privacy and dignity are from the Western literature. There is limited knowledge on these concepts in a non-Western cultural context. And still less can we find anything about how Chinese older people perceive what supports and what undermines their privacy and dignity. I think um, Dr. Elsie Hui and I myself, we have touched about this earlier in our previous panel session. Um, Hong Kong, just like any developed countries, is facing a problem of our uh, aging population. And um, we are seeing an increasing number of older people living in residential care homes in Hong Kong, and I've just um, uh, shared about this figure of 7%, about 7% of our older population are now in residential care homes in Hong Kong. And this is a picture demonstrating to you a typical residential care setting in Hong Kong, and especially for our uh, foreign friends. Um, people in residential care home in Hong Kong, they usually live in a big room, they share bed units, and in this particular slide, you can see that a bed and a bedside locker and a chair at the back of your bed, this is a typical um, living unit for an older person in a typical residential care home in Hong Kong. And in fact, um, a lot of research into the quality of residential care home provision has highlighted a lot of the problems of psychosocial care provision inside these homes. And I think the mass media is also very, um, uh, has also reported a number of incidences in residential care homes where, the, uh, where there are uh, incidents of elder abuse. And a lot of insensitive and disrespectful domestic chores and daily care have been identified, uh, both from the media and from our research work. So uh, this intrigues me very much in terms of um, 
how we could uh, understand what does it mean to support um, older people's privacy and dignity into residential care homes. And so therefore, I conducted a grounded theory study in terms of looking into how older people identify as what is meant by privacy and dignity. And so in this study, we have identified from the older persons in residential care homes what they see as privacy. So what is privacy meant to these older people um, in these interviews? Majority of the older people in the OH homes said that, no, I don't need privacy in residential care homes. Now, this is a very typical um, quote. A lot of the older people said that privacy is about having things concealed from others. In this residential care home, we have everything done together here. We eat, we chat, and we sleep together. You remember that slide? So they really do sleep together. So why do we need privacy? It's communal living here, and I dare to say that there is no need for privacy here. So majority of the older people in residential care homes said that there is no need for privacy in residential care homes. Some of them do say that it would be good um, if they could protect the staff there, could protect my personal and health information, and this I see as a way of respecting my privacy. A few older people said that privacy is about having personal time and personal space to do what one wants to do. So keeping personal possessions, especially money. One of the older women in a residential care home told me that she used to keep her money under her pillow. And once, when her pillow bag was being changed by the staff, her money were all gone to the laundry. And so she said that, you know, um, she felt very sad because of that. But she continued to keep her money under her pillow even after that event. And a few older people also said privacy is about not being interfered with when you do not want to. And privacy is also about not bothering others and others not bothering them. So these are what older people in residential care homes sees as privacy. And in respecting privacy in residential care homes, I asked them, so tell me, how do you uh, uh, see how we can respect privacy in residential care homes? The first thing they come up to me is that I hope staff will not gossip our information to others. So they see staff not gossiping elders' information to others as an important way of protecting their privacy. And apart from that, they seldom quote about how residential care homes could protect their privacy, except by telling me that they use a lot of their own efforts. For example, creating security for their own possession, like that a woman putting the money under her pillowcase. And then using existing resources provided by the home, such as padlocks, lockable toilet doors, etc., cetera, um, will be the ways they think that they are able to protect their own privacy in residential care homes. So these are all about privacy. How about dignity? So when asked about what is dignity in residential care homes, um, I could find from the data that all about dignity for Chinese older people is about being in satisfaction with relations. So satisfaction in relations is a core element, a core category in terms of defining what dignity is in residential care homes. And in this satisfaction, older people point to four important satisfaction in relations. First, they said that I will feel very dignified in the residential care home if my family is able to demonstrate acts of concern to me in front of everybody. For example, being taken out for meals during festivals and then being accompanied back from home leave by the son, not the daughter. If the son is going to accompany me back after dinner or after home leave, then I will feel I'm very dignified. And the second way of um, feeling dignified in a home is being cared for by staff with sensitivity and being treated equally by all staff. Residential home uh, uh, older people tell me a lot of stories about how they are being ill-treated by other residents when they first joined the the home, they call these people the kings and the queens who used to um, hit them with um, chairs and with everything uh, because they're just new to the home. And all the people also felt that staff in the homes are not treating everybody equally, so they will um, do some favors for those who are favorable residents. And they feel that these are not dignified acts. So apart from the family and uh, 
staff relations, having satisfying relations with other residents are also important. Just like I quote about these um, kings and queens in the home who used to, um, uh, they say, torture other people. So uh, uh, they feel um, dignified also when they feel that other older people in the home are showing concern and respect to them. And finally, they will feel dignified if they have opportunities to maintain contacts with life outside the home. So in order to support dignity in residential care homes for Chinese older people, then probably these three aspects will be very important. Involving family in care provision, have staff who are going to provide care to um, residents with sensitivity, and promoting resident-resident relationships are all important aspects of supporting dignity in OH homes. Now, on reflecting the data that I have about privacy and dignity in residential care homes, I find that um, all the data strongly reflect the influence of Chinese sociocultural values in terms of how we meant by respecting older people's privacy and dignity. Of course, the first thing is that a lot of the older people talked a lot about meeting collective rather than individual needs. So because of their understanding about meeting collective needs, they accept the limitations arise from communal living uh, much easier and better than those described in the literature for Western elder people. They also enjoy a sense of security and togetherness in the communal living, and they regard residential care home as a big family. And also, I think uh, there's no need for me to say anything more about the importance of family involvement in uh, how older people feel being uh, respected in OH homes. And I think the other thing that um, permeates through the data is there is a strong sense that older people uh, feel very satisfied with what is being offered in the home. So when older people said, being an elder, what other things should one request for? What else should I wish for if they, it means the residential care home people, cook every of my meal, and if anything happened and they help me, then I am already very happy. So this being satisfied with what is being offered is something very um, common uh, in the way that other people were talking through privacy and dignity. And of course, being obedient and respect for privacy is also something that older people felt that now um, I am uh, under the care of certain staff. I need to obey their directions and decisions. Okay. And so um, on reflecting on my study on privacy and dignity for older people in residential care homes, I feel like if we talk about uh, respecting older people, I think it is very important that we need to acknowledge older people as individuals, not only whether they are Western older people or Chinese older people, but older people as individuals who are having their own distinct life history and who are making choices within their own socioculturally determined norms and boundaries. And if we agree with that, that will call for a shift about our focus of care from an institutional focus of care to a modality that focuses on older people as unique individuals. And by saying that, I would um, say that person-centered care probably is the correct approach, or not correct, as I say, is the a better approach in terms of how we frame care to the uh, uh, older people in residential care homes. So I would like to acknowledge um, the earmark ground for supporting this study. Thank you. Well, um, when Nancy and Michael asked me to be a panelist for this particular conference, I was, um, I mean, I was a little bit um, um, nervous. You know, I, I don't have time to do research to collect the numbers and the facts to present to everybody, and I'm not sure whether I can contribute to everybody's knowledge. But I think they know that um, the nature of my work, I'm. Uh, uh, I'm a home care physician to, to start with, and now I'm, I'm overseeing a few programs, day centers, and developing community development for a community up, uh, a village approach to support the whole um, aging population, and an and a, a, a age-friendly primary care clinic uh, based on uh, Dr. Alex Kalachi's work. Um, so I think maybe they want to hear something about this from me. 
And the title that was given about what does it mean to respect an elder from east to the west, and but uh, sort of invoke um, a sense that I felt that perhaps I have to be really, really personal when I'm talking here. And uh, so bear with me, I'm just sharing with you my views. Um, so the, a bit of a background. So you know I'm from Singapore, I was born there, my parents were born in Singapore, but their parents were born in uh, Fujian province in the southern part. And uh, so, um, uh, and, and in Singapore, uh, you know, it's a very westernized society like um, Hong Kong it used to be a British colony. Uh, but among uh, the people in my cohort, I, uh, I, I loved uh, the Chinese literature and the Chinese culture. I read a lot of Chinese books. I was from a Chinese um, primary school, and um, I studied um, Confucian ethics in my high school. And um, I think compared with the average Joe, I do um, a bit more meditation than most other, which is a very Asian tradition. And you know, Singapore is at the crossroad between India and China, and it's in the Malay Indonesian archipelago, and I speak Malay. and so. These are my credentials as a East meets West. And then uh, in terms of my uh, clinical work, I'm a physician, so I see patients on the ground. And uh, so I will just like to address this from all this um, background that I have. So the question about uh, what does it mean to respect an elder, I, I like the word elder. We use the word elder here. And uh, I remember I learned about this from uh, Bill Thomas, the person who, who started the Eden Alternative Movement and approach in person-centered care. I mean, I, I'm very aware that this is a Western um, invention. And um, he used the word elder. And the way he defines elder is that anybody who cares for you, and by caring he means the person who can help another person grow. And so in that sense, an elder need not be older than you. So uh, in this regard, uh, respecting an elder would mean respecting everybody, including a child. But uh, when you look back at the Eastern culture, we have a special place for people who are older and for people who are more virtuous, that they, they really deserve more respect. I mean, the common terms that we use is 敬老尊贤. We never hear of people talking about um, uh, 尊敬小孩子, you know, respect of young children. Um, so uh, that made me have this thinking, because I heard from my boss, uh, Mary Ann Sao from Hong Kong before, and she said that um, there has been some studies, I couldn't quote it, that uh, the care for young children is instinctive. But to care for an older person has to be taught by the culture of the land. And so in this regards, I think it is important for the society to continue the emphasis on the care for the elders. Because if we forget about this and we lose this, we may just lose the whole tradition of caring for the older people. So, well, just um, coming back to this point, although elders respect Everyone deserves respect, irregardless of their age, um, uh, and my, my belief. Uh, but there has to be a special emphasis on people who are older. And then, um, of course, in Chinese tradition, people who are more virtuous. So now the main, main part, the main bulk of my talk is really about um, what does it mean to, be, to, to, to respect. So um, if you allow me, I'd just like to share with you uh, an encounter. Two days ago, I was teaching in a community gerontological nursing course, um, and this nursing officer who runs a daycare center posed this question, and this question is so, so familiar. It's about an older person who attends a day center who's got nasogastric tube, who's wheelchair bound, diabetes, stroke, and what have you, who refuses to take his 10 medications. And so the nurses, working under this nursing officer were, um, were facing a dilemma. Should we be serving the medicine or should we um, um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, follow his instructions and not um, serve it to him? And so he posed that question to me. Um, so what would you do? What would a respectful nurse do? Would you, I mean, he's got a lot of multiple conditions, and you know that if he doesn't take the medicine, he's going to suffer the complications of uh, disability and perhaps um, death, you know. And yet, uh, um, if you were to do that, you are doing something against his, uh, um, his wish. Um, so what would a respectful caregiver do? Well, some of you will 
I mean, we talk about this. I mean, if you're a clinician working in a team, you face this dilemma all the time. I mean, um, just a few days ago, I have a patient who was punched by the daughter, um, and he's got a bit sore. And uh, he comes, he still comes to our day center, and it's been like one to two years that we felt that he sh is better off in a nursing home, and yet we could not do anything about it. I mean, the details, you don't have the time for it, but this is a very common problem, and I'm sharing with you that there is a constant tension between the, I mean, uh, the social worker and the nurse. I mean, I'm talking about archetypes here. The psychosocial department and the health and safety department, there's a constant tension that some, this, this group is looking after the, 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 the hygiene factors, the security, the physiological needs, while the other group is talking about the loftier, the dignity, you know, self-care, I mean, uh, sense and belonging and dignity and so on. And there's constantly having this argument. So the social worker will ask everyone, what is health for if you're doing this, I mean? And then the nurse, the nursing officer told me the other day, I'm afraid we are degenerating into pacifist, um, going, uh, moving in on the path of least resistance, and everything we do, we just follow what the patients want to do, and we're all becoming lazy. So this was the usual thing that we have every morning when we have an interdisciplinary group meeting about um, decisions of care. So that was a dilemma, and this was a constant thing. Uh, I'm not going to just leave you on the lurch here, because I have another case I'd like to share. It's a patient that I've cared for for the last um, five to six years. For the first three years, he, he's a very wealthy man. His house is bigger than the, anyone that I've seen. And um, he, he was referred to us because he refused to get out of the house. Um, he's got multiple sores, and uh, he did not have dementia. He's got Parkinson's disease, and um, probably has a depression, but he refused to take medication and refused to get out of the house to see the psychiatrist. And uh, so the home care team was referred, and so I saw him, so me and my nurse. Every time we see him, he will scold us, and he'll say that, don't come, I know you're just after my money for three years. And uh, we will be prescribing medicine and causing him to eat, and he will hate to eat, and, uh, and so the, uh, the, the family would pound the medicine and put in the food, and then he would hate to eat the meals, until about three years later, when I was seeing him, and um, I'm, 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 bear in mind, I'm just talking about how, uh, this is another dilemma, he refused to eat, right? And uh, so, just something that struck me, there's a black and white photograph on his uh, wall, and so I, I asked him, who is this? He says, he's my father. Then I ask him, oh, um, was he born in Singapore? No, he was born in China. Which part of China? Of oh, South Fujian province. And which part? Nan'an. Which part of Nan'an? Shijing, Jiujing. Then I told him, this is where my ancestors come from. Then we started to talk about Nan'an, about my family, about his family. And then, you know what? For the last three years, he's been insulting me, insulting my nurse. But that day, he apologized. He said, Doctor, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been so rude to you. But you know what? The medicine tastes so bad. And when they put in the food, I just felt like it is spiked. Is it okay I don't take the medicine? And when he told me that, I felt, well, this is somebody telling me not to take medicine. So I said, okay, I'll do that. Let's remove all the medicine. But you have to watch out for this and that and that. So in a way, we had a moment, you know. And uh, so finally, after a few visits, over a few months, we concluded that uh, the fludrocortisone was useful to pump up his blood pressure. The madopa was useful to make him still able to move a little bit. The antidepressant wasn't working, so we stopped. So, um, and well, it's not entirely a happy ending. He's still bit bound and he's still grouchy. And, uh, uh, but that was how we resolved it. But um, so finally, I'd just like to conclude with a list of um, my proposition, what respect is. I've got uh, five points about what respect is. I mean, reflecting and, and so on and going through, end of, I mean, person-centered care, spark of life from Jane Verity, Tom Kidwood and all that. I think that respect is still a state of mind. It is about acknowledging the unique importance and value of an object. And in a clinical situation, it's a person. I mean, the Chinese word we call zun zhong is about putting importance to a person who is in front of you. And, 
and in, 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 in respect, all are equal, including oneself. And when the mind state of respect is present, there is always self-respect. I mean, I noticed this. And to be respectful is to be attentive and careful with the unique presence of a person, including the feelings, the perceptions, the values, the motivations, the choices, um, and all other aspects that, def that, that, that the person defined as his personhood. So sometimes it could be religion, sometimes it could be his um, heritage, his past history, I and mean, his, his um, life history. And number three, in order to be attentive and careful, one's mind has to be free from prejudices, expectations, biases, and any hints of violence or non-acceptance. So the moment when the clinicians do not uh, accept that person as he is, the sense of respect is not there, even though he may be going through the motion of informed consent, communication, or advanced care planning. And number four, to be attentive and careful, free from prejudices, requires mindfulness and attention to details, and as, as well as a lot of self-reflection. So in this regard, I believe the training of ethics, training of good clinicianship, requires a lot of um, personal um, uh, reflection and, and training, perhaps in, even in mindfulness. And in the team, what does it translate into? So the examples I gave you about my social workers and the nurse, the team requires moment-to-moment -moment understanding of the situation. And the tension is something we have, to, we have to ride on, we have to live with, and we have to accept. And it's not something that we have to avoid. And, and this, this constant debate and discussion on what is the right thing to do, I think it is a mark of respect. Number five. An inner state of respectful mind will translate into speech and behavior, and this may be modified by culture, and that is in Chinese we call the Li Mao. And, and in modern medicine, it can be translated into informed consent, open communication, advanced care planning, com comprehensive geriatric assessment to really understand the person, and, and this new uh, a relatively uh, new approach to care based on person-centered uh, philosophy. However, what respect is not, it is not the mere appearance of the speech or behavior of respect. It's not just merely informed consent. It's not just the practice of person-centered SOPs, communication, advanced care planning. And it is not merely placating another person, satisfying his or her requests, like a zombie. And this respect is Okay, so respect is not those, and this respect is making generalization of a person based on his attributes of age, gender, socioeconomic status, including applying studies, you know. This study shows that people are like that and you fall into this category and perhaps you should be like this. And another thing that is not respectful, I think, is imposing our values, thinking that what we believe in is better than what they believe in. And finally, my last statement is, in clinical dilemmas, respecting a person does not always solve the problem, but it is the right state of mind to solve problem with. And in my experience, it often helps because it smoothens the communication and communication solves problems. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I thank the organizer for the invitation. I thank Nancy for the introduction. I thank you all for your patience and uh, not leaving uh, until this moment. Um, I'm going to uh, discuss a Confucian perspective. I'm glad Dr. Wu from Singapore already mentioned Confucian values. I think he was the first person today who mentioned the word Confucianism. So I understand that it's not a fashionable word in town, but still the Confucian family values, at least, are still very influential in this place. 
Um, there are cultural differences in morality, and Confucian morality is uh, a morality of we usually say uh, differentiated and graded love, differentiated and uh, graded respect. And if you if you like to call it a non-egalitarian system of morality, I don't think you are mistaken. But anyway, I I, I would go a bit fast, and so you will not be bored by my Confucian propaganda, and hopefully we can address one important issue at last. So I think uh, regarding long-term care to elders, at least three important points Confucianism can make that are still very much relevant today. Uh, one, Adult children have more obligations to take care of their elderly parents, including their long-term care. Two, such obligations should be performed and guided in terms of Confucian rights. Lee, public policy, number three, public policy should be made in ways to encourage or facilitate undertaking of such obligations. Um, so, you know, as you, I guess, most of you know, in contemporary liberal culture and uh, the, the many, many influential liberal scholars like Jay English, Norman Daniels argue that adult children do not have moral obligations to take care of their elderly parents and, uh, and uh, the obligations should be the individuals themselves for those individuals who are not able to take care of themselves financially or you know, other ways. And the state has the obligation to take care of them. So roughly, there is a cultural differences here. And eventually, we may address what that exactly means. Um, but for Confucian is, Filial piety, I think somebody mentioned this, well, filial piety is kind of a root of Confucian morality. So that's, that's something very, very important. Um, although Confucian morality, the, the primary complete virtue, so-called Zhen, requires that one must love all human beings, but at the same time requires that you must first and foremost love your parents and take care of your parents. Um, and it's understood that uh, people naturally love other people in different ways, uh, implying that you have different obligations to different people in different relationships or in different contexts. And also, it's understood that this is not just a natural fact, it is also normatively, morally right. Um, um, so if you say like in classical filial piety, it says if you don't respect your parents, you only respect other people. It's really violating morality. I hope local participants here can easily look at these familiar Chinese words and quickly know what I'm talking about. So the Confucian morality used the so-called method of love by extension. That they understand that for you to love other people, love all people, you must first try to love those, those closer to you, namely your family members. Then you try to extend such love to those other people, especially strangers, you do not actually love in the first place. Um, similarly, you respect uh, your parents, grandparents, then you try to extend that respect to other people's parents and grandparents. Um, in, in the process of such love or respect performance, and uh, you need to uh, follow the rituals. Your parents are alive, you use, you know, you comply with the rituals in serving them. When they die, you comply with the rituals in burying them and uh, offering sacrifices to them. And in this process, the most important thing is the attitude of respect. If you don't respect them, you know, you don't really treat them in differentiated 
transition from you know, treating animals. So respect is very important. Um, this obligation of children to their parents includes at least three dimensions, three types of things. Um, so what does Confucian respect require today? Uh, I only want to mention one thing, of course, Dr. Wu and, uh, and uh, Professor Lee mentioned something else. I think it's also very, very important, but I'd like to emphasize this point. If one's elderly parents wish or prefer to live in their own home rather than move to an institution, one should respect their wish or preference. One should give necessary assistance to them for realizing this wish of preference. Um, uh, this is a universal fact, no cultural difference as far as I know. Given the choice, most elders would prefer to continue to live in their own homes, so-called aging in place. They grad but they gradually lose functioning ability and need assistance with everyday tasks. And in Hong Kong and uh, six, eight years, I forget my child, city university colleagues and I did the research in Hong Kong. At that time we found more than 95% of Hong Kong elders prefer to live in their own homes. And uh, from a, a report, I'm going to mention some facts or figures from their report, the same thing today, you know, also more than 95% of elders like to stay and continue to stay in their own homes. This is not only an issue for autonomy or what. I think they have a lot of reasons and comfort and a lot of other values for them to prefer to stay in their own homes. Uh, that's the, the, the report uh, uh, prepared by some Hong Kong U uh, colleagues in 2011. I, I just based on their report to, that's the reason, most reason I could find uh, about some figures we can look at Hong Kong situation. Um, uh, from my observation, most Hong Kong adult children shaped by Confucian virtual filial piety today still hold that they have more obligation to take care of their elderly parents. And also they still undertake such obligations in one way or another. Some offer financial assistance to their parents, some offer physical other care to their parents. I know some of my neighbors, you know, go to look after their parents once every day. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's still a reality. But problems, it's, I think it's a problem. I don't know if other people think it's a problem or not. Some young people do have changed their values to so-called voluntary choice. Namely that I should have freedom you know, to decide care for my parents, so not it should be a freedom of choice rather than a moral obligations. I think that means even for them to, at least for quite some of them to say, okay, I don't want to take care of them. I don't think I have moral obligations to take care of them. That's why they, some of them at least manipulate situations to try to send their elders to institutions, so-called residential service homes or whatever. And another problem I think is that our government failed to offer effective assistance with the children in Hong Kong who offer long-term care to their elders at home. Um, interestingly, our underlying principle says, you know, aging, in one's own home is the, is the call, is the principle. But reality is a bit uh, ironic. Um, some colleagues mentioned in the morning, you know, among most, uh, almost all uh, so-called developed, advanced societies we found, Hong Kong has the highest 
institutionalization rate. We have almost about 7% of the elderly stay in institutions, private or public uh, residential places. Um, uh, this, this table has more. The, the, on, on the right side is the, the so-called uh, community care services. In Hong Kong, we have the lowest rate of using community care services because we don't have much of such services compared to other societies. On the other hand, for people living residential, the institutions, we have the highest rate, almost 7% of the elders. Uh, then the report I just mentioned uh, says, you know, that uh, given this reality where people have a tendency, especially for family members, young people, and try to send their elders to, to the, the institutions. Um, and also, actually, all our institutions, either public or private, are funded by government, either directly or indirectly. So the primary fund provider is government or taxpayer or societies whatsoever. And um, so you look at these figures and uh, how many places for institutional places and uh, community care services places. Then the last line is how much money government spent. The first one the, on the left is for institutions, second one for, for um, community care. So we spend very little money on community care. So it's very difficult for elders to stay home. Of course, in order to increase community care, we have to, yes, relevant to a whole bunch of policy adjustment or reforms. I don't have time to get into it. But I do like to finally discuss one issue. Should society provide cash subsidy to family caregivers to their elders? There's a very interesting cultural objection in Hong Kong, I noticed. It roughly says this, Hong Kong's Confucian cultural norms emphasize the family's moral responsibility of taking care for older family members. Therefore, providing cash subsidy to family members for taking care of their frail older family members is monetizing their familial relationship and is thus uh, eroding or even corrupting the Confucian virtual filial piety. This objection seems to imply that, okay, because in Confucian culture, children have an obligation to take care of their elderly parents. Therefore, you should not get any money support. In other countries, you know, like in Australia, Canada, Ireland, and so on, they do offer money subsidy to family caregivers because they do not believe children have moral obligation to take care of their parents. Therefore, they can receive monetary subsidy. I think that a too simple relationship between moral obligation on one hand and some monetary support on the other. I would think a proper confusion replies this. Granted that familiar obligation is a special moral obligation and should not be paid through a normal salary as in performing other occupations in the market, market still society should offer certain cash subsidy to family caregivers as a proper incentive, not as a competitive salary. I have three reasons to support my Confucian view. One, such cash subsidy should be set at a significantly lower rate, for example, at least 50% lower than the salary of relevant job in the market. This way ensures that primary motive of family caregiver is filial piety, love, or respect, rather than making the money. Second, still the cash is subsidy, this cash subsidy offers appropriate financial incentive to encourage children to perform their moral obligation of taking care of their elderly parents. 
this is like the function of our parent A tax allowance for middle or upper class families. See, currently in our tax law, you know, if you offer up to $40,000 to your parent or a grandparent, and each this amount of money is tax free, that's an incentive. incentive. Although we have obligation under Confucian morality to financially help our parents, but still you get some financial incentive to do that, to help you to perform that argument, uh, that obligation more easily or more, more willingly. And, and finally, it's, this kind of cash subsidy is financially beneficial to our society in the long run. First, it should be, of course, offered only to low-income families. It's understandable. Middle class and upper class people, families have other ways taking care of elders, as in every society, right? Then these low-income families will be encouraged to help their elders live in their homes rather than send them to institutions. This will save money in the long run because in Hong Kong's institutions, as I said, you know, either directly or indirectly, all the money is from the government, from society. So, anyway, thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you all. What a wonderful discussion. My goodness. Um, so, a few. Um, just a, f a few interesting points that um, that I, I just to, to set up the discussion, um, Professor Fan. Uh, one of the points that, that that I heard there was filial piety in Hong Kong at least still matters, but l the long-term care needs, the tr the length of the trajectory is overwhelming practically to people. I found myself wondering what the life expectancy would have been when Confucius was writing you know the idea of how what it meant what it meant to be an elder um, versus what it what it means today as we've seen with uh, uh, demographic shifts um, and professor Lee what I was really struck by was how people are adaptable to changing circumstances things that would not uh, it, except when I my, my mother's 80 and this is exactly the sort of thing she said you know life continues to change and you continue to adapt to it and hope you don't break your hip, you know, pretty much. But uh, that that people were able to to say, well, this is how I've negotiated the reality of what my life is like now, and this is what still matters to me with respect to my family. And um, Wai Chong, who was my teacher in everything, um, what what was so interesting, I, I think, uh, that I heard was about the complexity of respect when a person is being cared for by a number of different people, um, and how easy it is, even when you have really well coordinated care, um, to look at a person as a health problem or a safety problem or a wants problem. Um, whether or not you're thinking, is this a good idea? Well, I'm satisfying their wants. That must mean I'm respecting them. Except when you see that this person is in an unsafe situation, you could be actually just kicking the problem to your colleague the next day to solve, rather than actually being very respectful. Um, so um, I wonder, uh, in, in the time remaining today, any thoughts or any uh, questions for our wonderful panel? Yes. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, comments of the panelists, really fascinating and stimulating. I, I take all that you said very well, but I want to raise this uh, concern or comment about how to, how, 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 what do we mean by respecting our elder, elders to a social level? Mm. Uh, because I, I, think, I think we need to look at that. Uh, as a society, I think, uh, rightly or wrongly, we have labeled different groups of people chronologically or otherwise. Uh, by, in terms of the age. Uh, I think if you want to respect an elder, which I, I believe I am one now by you know, census uh, definition, um, I would like to suggest a couple other thoughts. I don't like labels that are patronizing. I don't like labels that are perhaps creating stigma that may not be correct. I don't like perhaps labels that are patronizing. If you look at the elderly population now, particularly the baby boomers in Hong Kong, you will find out that they are probably the richest generation in history. They are also the best educated in terms of proportions of individuals that have higher education. 
and it will increasingly be so. So if you look at that, what does it mean to respect an elderly? Apart from some of the things that you talk about, which really represent a sense of gratitude towards our elder, or people that have done things for society for ourselves, that obviously is a common denominator. But I think there are two other things I would suggest that we would build this or encourage the government or even ask the government to facilitate this to be happening. One, maximize opportunities for the elderly to be socially and economically engaged to the extent they can. I mean, I love to, to eat uh, uh, wonton noodles, a bowl of wonton noodles. I couldn't find it now at the price that I can afford. <laughs> I mean, but you know that they're elderly, they can make those for a very reasonable price and perhaps for the best quality you can ever get. Bring them out. They can contribute to society. So I think that, you know, maximize the opportunities. I think secondly, it's really important to recognize the contribution the elderly can make in society in the respect of wisdom. Knowledge can be gained in many ways. Wisdom is not always easy to accumulate and pass on to the next generations. I think society needs to have that part of it captured and pass on to the next generations. How do you do that? Again, it will come back to engage and let the elderly have more opportunities to participate in ways that they feel comfortable and perhaps productive in doing so. I would add those dimensions. If you want to respect the elders, think about those. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, Professor, Professor Lee. Uh, thank you, that was great. A question for Professor Fawn. I'm wondering what you think Confucius would say about the limits of uh, uh, filial piety. So for instance, if someone were to say, well, I can either send my children to a good school or take care of my elderly parents, or if there's great cost to me, uh, if I won't be able to have children because I can't afford it because I have to take care of my elderly parents. Is there a limit to that in Confucius is one question. And then for Professor Lee, when you talked about privacy in your interviews, in my own mind, this may be my misunderstanding of ignorance, I would have thought you would have heard things related to saving face. That given that people in a nursing home may have many stigmatized things about themselves or their conditions, that those would be things that people may feel may be under threat in some way. And I'm just wondering if that came out at all. Do I answer the question? Yes. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I do think uh, this is a question, this is a problem of in principle. It's only a problem in context, I guess. There's certainly a limit. I guess even if we understand Confucianism as so-called virtue ethics, still, I guess every ethics has to make some distinction between obligation and supererogation. For example, I'm right now in Hong Kong, my mom, very elderly in Inner Mongolia, and she can be allowed to stay in Hong Kong for only three months, and I just have no way to, okay, I say I, I drop, I, I quit my job, I go back to Inner Mongolia to take care of her and my, in my home, as I seem to promote here, I, I guess I, that would be wonderful, but I'm sure that's a supererogation. However, on the other hand, if I do not even offer some financial support to my mom, and she's end up being poor and no money to, to support herself, I guess I violate my Confucian virtues in a minimal sense. So I, I'm sure there's a limit, but the moral obligation should still be there the context based. I don't think I can answer the question in principle for everyone. <laughs> Pardon me? May I just interject the question to make it a bit more interesting? What if you're a woman and you're working in Hong Kong and then uh, your mother-in-law or your mom needs you in Inner Mongolia, would you still be comfortable working in Hong Kong? 
I think nowadays, I don't think Confucian is more to distinguish sons and daughters, unlike sons have more obligation to take care of parents, uh, daughters do not. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that, you, you agree with that, right? Actually, I, I, from my own encounters with um, Chinese women, I mean, it's not just Chinese, it's Asian women, they tend to have a sense of guilt whenever they putting so much effort in their work, neglecting their, I mean, not really neglecting, that they have to straddle between the caring for the younger generation and the older generation and expectations of societies on them. And so I thought, um, uh, um, just wondering whether Confucian ethics um, had any influence in this or any, uh, was it able to address this? But it's very nice to hear from you that it's actually the, the men that were expected to take care of their parents uh, and not the the daughters, but about the daughter-in-law? Um. Yeah, I, I, I think <laughs> the reality today is, if from my observation, for both China and Hong Kong, and daughters do better than sons. Um, that, that's because uh, men, uh, boys, are nowadays are no longer virtuous. <laughs> Uh, I just, uh, in the interest of time, I just have a quick response. Um, you talked about <clears throat> saving face. Yes, um, in my interviews with the older people, they talked a lot about saving face, but that is not directly with privacy. When they talked about how they feel dignified in the home, um, they feel like if the family is able to be continued to involved in care um, in the home, then this will be you know, f a feeling of being feeling very dignified. And saving face actually is more about um, having others to look and to see that their families are looking after them. So because a mission into OH home is like really like a, a kind of like loose face, not only for the elder person, but for the whole family. And can I have a quick response to Professor Liu's um, coming? Professor Liu, I can't agree with you more about the fact that um, these concepts about what is respecting older people and how do we respect older people actually is changes. For example, in my study about privacy and dignity, I'm sure when we become older people, and if I'm being interviewed when I'm old, asking me what privacy and dignity are for me will be very different from the data when I was you know, interviewing older generation, not of the baby boomer or the younger generation, but really these are the old, old people, and their perceptions about um, privacy and dignity are very different. So that's why we need to continue to strike for knowledge about what does it mean to respect older people. You know, um, it's not just this set of data will be you know, uh, applicable to uh, older people of all generations. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to raise a question to my uh, friend, Ray Ping. Um, I know you are die-hard uh, Confucian, right? <laughs> you, you basically accept everything uh, that Confucius uh, has said, as I know. Uh, but, but I guess uh, my reflection is that, uh, listening to what you have said today, uh, the, the kind of claim that you made today uh, seems to me pretty soft. By, uh, by that, I mean that most people here I mean, surely most people who care about filial piety will agree with what you have said. So in that case, I mean, like the respect the elderly, I think it's something that everyone or virtually everyone would agree with. Now, in that case, we don't need Confucianism. Now, why? Because Confucianism says a number of other things, like that probably you won't accept. Uh, for example, like, uh, you know, we have a duty to stay near the grave of our parents after they pass away for three years. And probably these and other things that Confucius has said about women and so on, or uh, uh, duty of the subject to emperor and so on, that uh, we don't accept. So, so I'm just wondering if certain things are, you, you know, if some of the things that you've said today, for example, is something that all of us would agree with, we don't need Confucianism. And to the extent that Confucianism says something that is pretty controversial, we can't accept it because nowadays there's this idea of uh, public reason, which comes from uh, an overlapping consensus. That is something that people should accept. I mean, the kind of idea, the kind of reason that people will accept, irrespective of, of our religion, philosophy, or metaphysics, right? And surely, 
uh, confusions that would be would not be a public reason to the extent that it, you know it, it is it's not something that everyone would agree with. So I'm just wondering. I, I'm I'm posing a dilemma, and that is if some of the things that Confucius have said is pretty soft, uh, in the sense that we will agree with, we don't need it. Now it's pretty controversial. If he, he says something that is pretty controversial, we won't agree with it. So I'm just wondering, what's the, no, what, I, how will you respond oh, to thanks this? Thanks for the question. I think you have to look at our major problem here. The major problem here is our, most of our elder people, like other elder people in other places, like to stay in their homes. But our children somehow want to push them to institutions care. And our government does not try to help the children and try to, you know, continue like, to, you know, be committed to Confucian filial piety and try to help these children to take care of their parents at homes, whether they, you know, live under the same roof or not. And th th that's a really big issue. Here, it's not, uh, it's not uh, I choose a, a soft Confucian view. If we can try to change the policy, for example, like the last issue I'm talking about, you offer some financial incentives to family caregivers, that would help a lot. But I understand that would be very difficult to do for government, for a whole bunch of problems, as you understand. One big problem is the cultural difference. Here, at least up to today, I think most of our parents and families spend most of their resources on children's education. They are not prepared well for their own retirement. So they somehow cannot rely on themselves to to take care of themselves so well. And at least compared to the the so called independent Western citizens in other similarly well uh, affluent societies and individuals there, you know, really prepared, you know, I guess they plan their life better. They can prepare take care of their children's education, also take care of their retirement, retirement so well. But our reality is up to today, most of our parents have not prepared that very well. They spend every penny almost on their children. And in return, children do not want to take care of them. And government somehow feel, yeah, free choice, okay. If, if you know, children want to take care of them, fine. If don't, don't, uh, you know. That's their choice. So that's our reality. Yeah. Um, and our, we have a lot of questions, and we're we're past five o'clock. Should we continue for a little, a few more questions? Do you think? Okay. Um, let's have uh, you, the person with the microphone. <laughs> um, my question is for Professor Fan as well. I um, haven't measured any of the statistics that you um, you've put up on the screen but I was startled to see the the number that you had for Hong Kong I just want to double check that it really says that so many people are, are elderly people are institutionalized um, because I grew up in the West where we talk constantly about how um, youngsters don't take care of their kids um, our youngsters don't take care of their parents very well and now I'm a, I'm a newcomer to Hong Kong, and almost everywhere I look, and, and families that I go see, um, all frequently are taking care of their parents. I mean, it's, it's been eye-opening and, and wonderful, too, to see this. But I, I see so many um, elderly parents living with their 40- or 50-year-old children, um, and I think it's great. But from your statistics, it, it suggests that the story is not that common here. Yeah, we, we Confucian people are very quick learners. We can learn, you know, from uh, other values very quickly. And go, go to mainland China, you see. Right now, even if you want people to have uh, more, more than one child, most people don't want to have more than one child. So Chinese, Confucians 
um, not very good in maintaining their values, even if the values are good. That's because I think generally in in recent time, at least you know, in recent 100 or 150 years, and Chinese people totally lost their confidence, lost their cultural confidence. They they, they cannot uh, understand, uh, you know, some things in their tradition is very good. They want to quickly learn from the West. However, they don't really understand. I'm talking about myself, okay? I'm sure most Hong Kong scholars here understand West much better than me. But I can be representative of a lot of Chinese people, Hong Kong people. We thought West is in some way very individualistic. You know, we said, you know, you only everyone takes care of oneself and does not take care of families. One. And the, some liberal argument, like I mentioned, Jay English, Norman Daniels, shows us something like that. But the Western reality may not be really like that. I, I, at least I lived in America for many years, and I see a lot of families, maybe influenced by Christian morality. They still have very close family relationships. They take care of each other. But the information from West to us is no, no, no. Western people are very, all very independent. You know, they, they, they elderly uh, young people really, you know, do not take care of their elderly. They don't even go back to visit their parents once a year or something like that. So we can quickly move in that way. So I think that uh, that uh, information is very misleading and but as the dominant information from my understanding, even here in Hong Kong. There's quite a few other questions. There's Thank quite you. a few people on the side of the room, too. Hi, Franklin Lam, Hong Kong 50. We do policy research. I want to seek the panel's views. If you see respect for the elderly being a waxing trend or waning trend, um, I can see arguments on both sides. Uh, in the case of Hong Kong, um, first of all, I think there's always, we were always taught that in Chinese saying, uh, if you have an elderly at home, it's just tantamount to having uh, almost like a national treasure at home. So that's a good thing. But then there was the times when, when we didn't really have the internet, when the older you, you, you are, the more you learn, the more knowledge you have, but now you have Google. And Wikipedia kind of cut the intergenerational tapping of knowledge right there. So. Then I suppose the, for the younger generation, the respect for the old would come from the, what are called the um, Saving Private Ryan effect. Because you know, the, the, the last generation, the, 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 the generation that gave birth to, to baby boomers like myself, they went through hell. The Second World War uh, followed quickly by the Civil War, by the Korean War, all hit Hong Kong in massively in the sequence of around three to five years. So they all, uh, uh, every poor couple managed to bring up six kids with no family support, uh, nor, uh, nor government support. So we owe them a lot. So we have to earn this. So to me, that was probably the link between the young generation and the elderly, that we owe them for enduring all the stuff so that we have the prosperity we have today. But that's kind of a strange uh, link. Um, it, the, the, we were no longer, when, for instance, we're no longer taught Confucian values at school. Um, um, and so, so, and yet the thing that's on the positive side, what surprises me is the family council uh, they did a survey to say and, and found that 85% of uh, people here would say that they would support the, 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 the uh, parents financially. And close to 80% even go to the extent of saying they're going to live with the parents if the need arises. Now those are very firm numbers and you, and to the validation of this is go to any restaurant on the a, on a weekend. Basically, the 10 person tables are always packed. There are very few tables or two. So I think those values are very much alive. Yet there's an, another conference I attended on, on OH care and the, the survey, the, the question that was raised was there are like 15 tables uh, each having around 15 people. And the question was, how many of you would, in, the, in the audience would support your, your parents? People on 14 and a half of those 15 tables raised their hands. 
The question that was raised was, how many of you expect your children to support you? Only half a table raised their hands. Then I thought, should I interpret it rightly? Just on the face of it, this is, looks terrible. So we lost it in this generation. But then I thought at the end of the day was Confucianism. Confucianism was passed down not because there are a lot of books in China over the last 5,000 years teaching everybody to support their parents. Confucianism was something that's observed and passed down. So what, those, what that table hand raising told me was that basically every generation gives everything uh, 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 to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the kids. And we return the kids would know they would repay. So just as this generation will give, give everything to do the kids, but asking nothing in return is exactly the reason why, those, why the, the next generation will continue to respect the elderly. By giving maximum, and, 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 and for the younger generation to see what the parents are doing to the grandparents, it's probably the, the way that the Confucian value might be passed down. But those are theories. I'm, I'm confused either way. So I'm not so sure how you would interpret whether respect for the elderly for global cities or for Hong Kong is on the rise or on the wane. Th thank you very much. I wonder, I, there are a few more questions. And so let's just take one more. Sorry, my um, Peter Ha Young from um, the uh, Carlo West Cluster Clinic Ethics Committee, also from the Catholic Diocese of Hong Kong. Um, actually, I was thinking more along the um, a com to, to, well, the, mainly the comment um, well, of the previous question raised to uh, Professor Fan. The, the thing about you, you know, saying that uh, what the, the, the last professor said was asked was, that, well, you know, it, it's about the soft things. Sure, we've, um, there are lots of things that not just one religion, and as our last meeting in Mexico City, we know that we have a lot of things in common, that we came from both Confucianism and Catholicism. Um, but um, no, surely, filial piety, that's the fourth commandment, you know, and that is in the uh, Jewish text as well as in the Christian text. But I think that the other thing is, uh, or rather the thing that we have to think about is, sometimes just because some everything, something is agreed on by everybody doesn't mean that there isn't contribution from whatever religious or philosophical or other, um, this, um, this is just a, a comment on the, to the questioner, that um, there isn't anything that uh, we can't take. And as for those controversial things that which we might not actually see eye to eye to, to or sometimes we may see eye to eye, but like, for example, in um, um, Aristotle's meta, um, in, in Nicomachean ethics, you know, you have the good man, which sounds a bit like the Junji in um, Confucianism. You know, sometimes they look superficially similar, but as um, Alistair McIntyre would say, you know, they're actually um, at the bottom, actually quite incommensurable. I think, I think we, uh, there is also a need to explore some of the more controversial things at the edges of, you know, our uh, consensus which actually teases out why we are doing what we are doing. And I think that's, um, this is a more philosophical comment about what different traditions can or cannot contribute to, um, um, you know, here we have building bioethics capacity in Hong Kong. And I think in quite a few places, you know, there is a more, um, shall we say, uh, moral philosophy or actual metaphysical philosophy tradition, and we haven't got that, particularly among the um, physicians and the healthcare people in Hong Kong, but I think we, we really do um, benefit from actually exploring some of these areas. Thank you very much, and that's an excellent place to stop our first day. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, is there anything, Michael, any, any housekeeping? We're adjourned. Thank you so much. Well, I've got some housekeeping. Oh, you have to announce. Well, okay. well I, I would like to announce that uh, this will be the end of the first day of the conference. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for the panels as well to have a wonderful closing uh, for the launch conference of the day one.